It's good to see you this, this evening. A very warm welcome. Let me introduce our very special speaker, Dr. Ma. Dr. Li Ma, Mary, grew up in China's atheistic education system. She obtained a master's degree in sociology from the University of Oxford, 2003, and then a PhD in sociology from Cornell University, 2010. Mary experienced a deep conversion into the Christian faith while in New York when writing up a dissertation on China's internal migration and urban inequality. Since then, her academic interests broadened to include theology, missiology, and church history while teaching sociology at a top university in Shanghai. Since 2012, a research grant allowed Mary to join the Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics at Calvin College as a research fellow. Her first book on Chinese Christianity, Surviving the State, Remaking the Church, a sociological portrait of Christians in mainland China, was published last December, was an instant success. Congratulations. It was ranked among Amazon's best sellers in church history and was nominated for the Graham Meyer Award in Religion. Her forthcoming book this summer will be The Chinese Exodus, a theology of migration, urbanization, and alienation in contemporary China. Dr. Ma is currently working on her second book on Chinese Christianity titled China's Lost Theologian, T.C. Chow. 1888 to 17, 1979. That's the right sequence. So let me introduce the, the lecture tonight from Dr. Ma. How did churches in China survive communism? The survival to revival of Protestant churches in communist China has been embedded in the political and economic structural changes of this country since 1949. And Dr. Ma is going to unpack that in different perspectives. A very warm welcome to Dr. Ma this evening. Thank you for uh, being here and um, thank you for the warm welcomes and I'm so glad to share with you um, this topic tonight. Twelve years ago in Ithaca, New York, a conversation I had with my friend Ming Dong Paul Lee has forever changed me. By the way, Paul is now the professor of business here at Wheaton. I remember asking him with all seriousness, why is it that you and others believe in a God, but I don't? By that time, I've, I have had three years of experience living and studying um, overseas. But having not heard of the Christian gospel for Christian message for the first 25 years of my life in mainland China, it was the first time I took this question seriously. Paul did not give me the classic proofs of God's existence. Instead, he discussed with me about how a culture may shape its people. He encouraged me to think out of the box of my cultural baggage, which has been loaded with atheism. That was a key step for me, to change from an atheist to at least an agnostic, which looking back was an improvement. <laughs> Later, my conversion to the Christian faith took place after a series of providential occasions. So before God spoke to me through his word, he actually did through cultural reflections. Since then, I've been keenly interested in finding out the relationship between the Chinese society is culture and Christianity. So what I'm going to accomplish in this evening's lecture is to address the question, how did churches in China survive communism? I hope this presentation will not only inform you with many historical facts and sociological analysis, but that it will inspire you to think about the shaping power of culture itself its potentials as well as limitations. The difficulty with studying a culture is its multi-dimensionality. 
One has to know the demographics, the history, the politics, the written laws, and unwritten social, for, social norms. So I will need to go into these, some of these details and then come back by way of conclusion on the role of culture in the context of Chinese Christianity. And first, I want to start with two factual scenarios. In April of 2014, the Daily Te Telegraph, a national British media, published an article titled, China on the Course to Become World's Most Christian Nation. At the same time in China, four excavators de demolished an eight-story state church building in Wenzhou, a region known as China's Jerusalem. In the same year, a research shows that Chinese online searches for the word Christian churches, which is Jiao Hui, and Jesus, Yesu, have far outnumbered those for the, Chi for the Communist Party and Xi Jinping. <laughs> These two examples show the, the unusual growth and yet still contentious existence of Christianity in today's China. People always like to start by asking me, so how many Christians exactly are there in China? <laughs> well, in numerical terms, the growth has certainly been staggering. Although there has not been any national survey census data, estimates show that Christians now constitute between two and four percent of the total population. Remember, China has a population of 1.4 billion. That is by adding roughly 80 to 100 million Protestants and over 15 million <coughs> Catholics together. But the more substantial question I often hope to direct people's attention to is, what kind of Christianity is there in China now? And this photo is the cover image of my book. As you can see, it has a statue of Mao, a cross on a conspicuous state church, and actually, if you can't see it, there is a casino and a science museum in the background, too. Mm -hmm. I like this photo because it neatly captures the key cultural elements of today's China. It's official communism, Christianity, consumerism, and technology. In today's China, churches live in the cultural milieu of not just communist, revived communist nationalist sentiments, but also a consumeristic urbanism and the convenience and noises provided by social media and technology. To Christians in mainland China, their loves, fears, and desires are not unaffected by these cultural parameters, particularly with the political ideology of communism. The coexistence of these two cultural components, which is communism and Christianity, had a complicated history as China encountered modernity. Since the violence of the Boxers' Rebellion in 1900, Protestant missionaries arrived in China searching for a more strategic approach for mission. Unlike a previous generation of missionaries who just preached and handed out tracts, this new generation were entrepreneurial in using modern experimental methods and business models to expand mission through education institutions. This growth in educational mission was an acknowledged anomaly in world mission history. Here are some estimates in the early 20s. For example, in the area of higher education, American missionary societies alone founded 13 Christian colleges, including this one, Yale in China. At the time, China itself only had two public universities. At the same time, there is a market of ideas in China, due to uh, thanks for uh, thanks to missionaries' translation of Enlightenment, Enlightenment literature and the spread of the printing press. Different streams of thought competed for allegiance among educated Chinese. These include traditional Confucianism, secular. Enlightenment liberalism, Protestant Christianity, and Bolshevik communism. In the same time, prolonged warfare, both domestic and international, radicalized nationalistic sentiments for China's independence. This made communism a more appealing ideology. 
Communist mobilizations gained wider ground, even within Christian colleges. For example, in 1918, Yale in China's Hunan campus once appointed a young man as the editor of his Chinese journal, The New Hunan. Can you guess who it was? That's right. <clears throat> this is the Yale News in 1978. His name, is, his name was Mao Zedong. The mission rented space for 25-year-old Mao to run a bookshop. Using this space, Mao opened up more stores, each of which sold communist literature. This was not an isolated case, because later many core members of the YMCA joined Mao in Yan'an and became propaganda cadres. Also in the 1920s, the indigenous church grew under the leadership of some pietistic and fundamentalist leaders who are considered as the patriarchs of the Chinese church. By the 50s, when China was under communist rule, this trend of rapid church growth was soon reversed. Hostile campaigns not only forced foreign missionaries to retreat, but indigenous leaders were also imprisoned. So I divide the following decades into four phases. And for each phase, I describe the background and then share some oral history narratives from my book. The four phases are militant communism from 50s to 70s, pragmatic communism from 80s to 90s, developmental communism from, the, uh, from 90s to 2008, and Weiwen communism since 2008. From the 50s to 70s, a form of militant communism launched a total war on Christianity. The communist state set up a system of patriotic churches and coerced leaders to join. Since, since the start of Mao's Cultural Revolution, even state churches were closed down. Maoism and Marxism became a politicized religion of the state. Historian Daniel Bayes once wrote, in the first half of the 20th century, the foreign missionary movement in China matured, flourished, and then died. The newly born Chinese church was left to survive as an infant homegrown faith. Ways to connect with the outside world was, were limited to almost zero. Outside China, missionaries and church historians expected the young church in China being choked by imprisonment and mob violence. Could the church continue to grow? Here's the story of Yang Xiaokai. He was a 16-year-old 16, 16 red guard who wrote a big letter poster titled, Wither China. His reflections on the violence and disorder in, in society in this writing led to a 10-year imprisonment. But this decade of captivity turned out to be his university education for it was in prison where he learned from the best scholars in China. <laughs> he also met Christians there. Yang marveled at the fact that anyone could be so consistently selfish, even in a time like that. Then after his release, Yang entered into graduate school without a college degree, and then won a scholarship to pursue a doctorate in economics from Princeton University. But it was not until later in his life when he was diagnosed with cancer, that Yang converted to Christianity. His written testimonies and reflections on biblical worldviews has been instrumental in bringing younger educated Chinese to accepting the faith. By the way, he is the only Chinese economist who was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize. Yang's life story shows how Christianity did spread, even in prison cells. It's not an isolated case, although for Yang, it took longer for the seed to come to fruition. In the early 70s, we come to hear another story from a Chinese medicine doctor, Zhang, who was converted in the high tide of Mao's campaigns. At the time, surveillance by secret police and public denunciation meetings planted seeds of distrust and fear into the, into the hearts of every individual. Nevertheless, it was a highly ritualized society with Mao worship as the only legitimate liturgy. 20-year-old Zhang was then classified as a backward element because his father used to work for the Nationalist Party. 
During the bleakest time of his life, Zhang visited his middle school math teacher, Li. A Christian believer, Li was previously sent to Jia Biengou, the harshest labor camp for Chinese intellectuals, also known as China's Gulag. Teacher Li was among the very few who had returned alive. <coughs> Zhang and Li had a life-changing conversation. In his own words, Teacher Li, why are you always so joyful? What made you so different from other people? He answered me, an empty sack does not stand. What is in your sack then? I'm a Christian. I thought to myself, yes, of course you are. Isn't that the reason of your mistreatment? Then I asked him further, what does that have to do with my question? Teacher Lee said, you don't understand. Christianity is a worldview. Then he shared the gospel with me. It was the year 1971. Here's more in Zhang's own words. Teacher Lee also gave me a mathematical formula. 80 divided by infinity equals zero. As he explained, 80 means 80 years of joyful living in this life, and infinity refers to the existence of hell, which involves eternal pain and suffering. The result of zero means that 80 years of bliss may end up in nothing. He also gave another alterna alternative explanation, 80 years of suffering for the sake of God divided by the eternal bliss of heaven equals zero too. So, in summary, it does not matter whether you live 80 years of earthly bliss or suffering. What matters most is the direction of infinity, heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. Then, Teacher Lee told Zhang about God's creation, fall, redemption, and the hopeful consummation. Hearing these, all teachings of communism have collapsed inside Zhang. He became a Christian with no baptism, no church, no Bible for the next eight years. By the way, Bibles were only available through smuggling uh, from abo uh, abroad, and its legal publishing took place after 1986. Prayer was John's only lifeline. By the time when I interviewed him, John was in his 60s leading a house, uh, house church. In the 80s and 90s, a more pragmatic form of communism assisted China's transition from a centrally planned economy to an opening up society. Church leaders were released from prisons, and foreign min missionaries re-entered on tourist or business visas. Home gathering groups, like the picture on the uh, image on the right, mushroomed across the country. By then, the socialist Danwei system, which places individuals into rigid work units with public housing, also pre prohibited larger scale of assembly beyond these home gathering groups. So church sizes during these two decades were small, like around a dozen members. State surveillance, pol political evictions, and irregular short-term missionary work helped bring about a generation of Chinese converts who embraced a new Christian identity, but were also were also cut off from continued mentorship. They were a generation of spiritual orphans left to grow up by themselves. Many have walked a lonely and truncated spiritual journey led by different mentors that came along the way. Before 1987, Bibles were strictly banned in China. Families that owned one copy would share it with other believers or copy some portions for memorization. Sometimes a church group would need to borrow the only Bible from another village for their entire neighborhood to use. They did this with great caution. I heard a testimony of a shared copy of the Bible being passed around during a secret home gathering, and many kissed it and shed tears on the red fringes of the Bible, the pages. Before church networks become more visible and teachings widely available, these new converts mainly fed on bits and pieces of the Bible that they could obtain. By then, Zhang, who um, was a young man, had been working as a Chinese medical doctor, but his unbelieving wife had reported his religious identity to the Communist Party committee of the hospital where he worked in. With tension in his home and workplace, Zhang longed for fellowship 
and he found a small group of home gathering Christians led by a pastor who was recently released from prison. This was eight years after his conversion. In an age of food scarcity and trust scarcity, John was deeply touched by the love of these Christians. Here are his words. It was a spiritual home where I heard many good testimonies. I still remember one of them. A believer's family became a target to be humiliated and denounced during the Cultural Revolution. They took a young <coughs> woman up on the stage and asked her mother-in-law to sit and watch her from the front row. This old woman held up her face with a smile and looked at her daughter-in-law. She later said, I was praying and did not feel embarrassed for my daughter-in-law was suffering persecution for the Lord's sake. It was an honorable thing. That story was such a faith boost for me. I also remembered an Uncle Long who treated me with such love. He had many children, so they were just making ends meet. Once he noticed that I was wearing a worn out pair of shoes, he started saving money and bought me a pair of leather shoes. He gave, me, he gave them to me saying that I could wear them to evangelize more people. You have to know that at the time, these, those shoes cost 15 yuan, which was roughly a month's, a month's wage. It was too precious a gift to me, and so I ended up giving them as an offering to the church. By the, by the late 90s, the growing market economy has created new space for urban evangelism. For example, on college campuses, mission organizations such as Navigators and Campus Crusade for Christ send their young mission workers to reach out Chinese college students in their college cafeterias. Short-term missionaries also reached out to urban residents in chain stores such as McDonald's and Starbucks. In both kinds of locations, Bible studies and discipleship training took place. The location, these locations provide a noisy yet publicly sheltered space for religious training and conversations to go undetected by the government. But these individual evangelistic efforts tend to be random, informal, and inconsistent. So it is hard for them to maintain a long-term mentoring relationship. When communicating about Christian matters using emails, text messages, or even in daily conversations, these new mission groups tend to use code language to avoid the watchful eyes of authorities. So when these new converts became leaders for other even newer convert, uh, believers, they're like five-year-olds trying to raise one-year-old. They often lacked what is needed in mature biblical understanding and accountable leadership. Here's the story of Bao. He accepted the Christian faith through a campus ministry. After graduation, he became a full-time minister, minister. With the passing of time, Bao started to notice some problems in his own Christian life. Some believers of his cohort initially showed a strong zeal for their newfound faith, but after graduation, they stopped professing it. Some were even publicly testifying against the faith. In his own life, Bao also noticed that his real, realistic struggles were not renewed by the faith he initially embraced. Or in other words, the gospel message he was first introduced to seemed too super, superficial to counter real life challenges. After eight years, his Bible knowledge did not grow much beyond the New Testament because most foreign mi missionary workers focus on these relatively easier books when teaching new converts. Once these new, co new converts enter the workplace, life seems com compartmentalized into sections that are Christian and those that are not. They have not been taught to look at the world with a holistic Christian worldview. Such a lifestyle is easy to maintain in college, where life in general is more idealistic and simple. However, after graduation, these new converts are plucked from fellowship groups but are not regularly congregating with fellow believers. As a result, many lose their faith uh, after, at later, later stages of life. This narrative also shows, reveals a less noticed fact. Although the growth of Christianity has been fast in China, the attrition rate has been high too. Since the early 2000s, when private property rights were rewritten into, into the Chinese constitution, 
and with the booming housing market, more public space opened up for churches to rent or own. Being able to acquire properties enabled churches to expand. On an observational level, urban churches which gather in residential apartments, like the image on the left, normally grew from a dozen to 200 members in just three to four years. These churches are showing some collective identities too. Compared to the 90s, when many urban churches were named after their founders, like Auntie Wang's or Uncle Joe's, in the early 2000s, urban Christian groups are taking on names that help them form a collective identity, such as Living Stone Church, Streamside Church, etc. With the growth of urban churches, the demand for pastoral resources is rising too. Churches, need, churches not only need to reach out to college students and urban professionals and care for the homeless, they also face the need to pastor the urban elite group, which I call specialized prof professionals. Here is a personal narrative. Wang is the president of a top state art academy. He holds international exhibits regularly and is considered a leading oil painting artist in China. Since Wang and a few artists in his academy became Christians, they started a home gathering group with a lay minister teaching them the Bible. But over the years, this minister's pietist and mission center theology began to downplay the meaningfulness of art. When this house church gradually expanded to include neighboring residents, the group of artists who first helped start the church felt marginalized. There were a few times when the minister even preached from the pulpit that art is meaningless and secular, if not satanic. While the whole world is waiting to be saved, gradually many artists stopped attending, including Wang himself. They struggled with the meaning of their profession and its relationship to God's kingdom. Self-doubts and frustration even dragged a few into a wither stage of artistic creation and emotional depression. Still desiring comfort from God's word, Wang sometimes went unnoticed to attend the communion at a nearby state church. Some of these specialized professionals are highly prestigious in their professional circle, but in the church, they are a marginalized group, minority, whose theological as well as social needs are seldom met. Most evangelical leaders approach them with a naive, if not an arrogant attitude. And very few churches successfully reach out to other specialized professionals who are seekers in the faith. Since 2008, and particularly 2012, China has entered into a different phase of Weiwen communism. In Chinese, the word Weiwen means to maintain social stability. In an age of increased rights awareness and rising social inequality, the Chinese state ad adopted more strategies, quote, to harmonize the society, such as internet censorship and crackdowns on associationism. Before the Beijing Olympics in, eight, uh, in 2008, the government did show a gesture of further opening up, but things afterwards deteriorated. The Chinese regime reversed to a stronger nationalism with Maoist nostalgia. How do churches respond to this new tide of nationalism? The, univer the universality of the Christian church, to some degree, serves to dampen the effects of such national nationalistic propaganda. After all, the Christians are also embracing a range of plural pluralistic identities. But meanwhile, differential access to censored information has divided the Chinese. Take the rural urban digital gap, for example. Urban residents, on a whole, have a higher chance of accessing censored information on the internet. Their understanding of China can differ greatly from rural residents who mainly rely on state media. So even Christians in China are not completely immune to nationalistic sentiments. These find expression a lot of time through China-centered mission plans promoted by certain Christian groups. There are three prevalent narratives. Number one, the prosperous and Christian China has become God's next chosen nation 
to bring the gospel back to Jerusalem. Has anyone heard of it? Number two, China's economic assistance to less developed countries such as Africa and the Middle East are providential opportunities for Chinese missionaries. Number three, with the decline of spirituality in the West, it is now the turn of China's emerging vibrant churches to revive the rest of the world. One example is the change in a Chinese indigenous hymn writer, Xiaoming. She enjoys a reputation among the Chinese like Fanny Crosby in the English speaking world. <laughs> Many of her hymns are also being sung in churches here in the States. The amazing thing about this hymn writer is that she only had an eighth grade education in rural Henan and never <coughs> learned music. She recorded hymns with a portable recorder and later professional musicians wrote out the notes. So far, a collection of Canaan hymns has over 1,500 a, a hymns written by her or sung by her. But by, and this one was actually my favorite uh, on the right. But by 2008, nationalistic rhetoric has changed the tone of her newly composed hymns. What used to be deeply devotional in the midst of suffering for the faith and obscurity began to take on a pride in China's greatness. And since 2014, we know maybe some of you read in the news that many state churches, uh, also called three self churches, experienced a setback by the decrossing movement. Over, over, 100, uh, over 1,700 crosses in Wenzhou were removed by the local authorities. Then in subsequent years, uh, there, are, there were a few anti-Christmas campaigns too. Still, these need to be placed back into the nation's broader movements, such, such as the, the Urban Renewal Project, Nationalism, and Anti-Associationism. For example, since the late 90s, the rate of forced evictions and demolitions has grown significantly, as city and county level governments have increasingly come to rely on land sales as an important source of revenue. A research shows that in uh, 2010, land sales accounted for 40%, sorry, 70 percent of local government income. So local governments have high incentives to push for demolition campaigns in its urban renewal projects. And since 2016, the country, the country also saw a chill in NGO associationism, along with the suppression of journalists and lawyer groups. To sum up, um, I hope to conclude by summarizing three points about Christianity's embedded growth in China's social and cultural changes. This, this graph, the, the red line, kind of um, is an estimated growth trend. I drew myself, it's not the accurate projection, but kind of uh, shows you like the points when um, major changes happen um, that affects the fluctuation of growth. Three points I will make about Christianity's embedded growth in China's social and cultural change. Point one, the growth of Protestant churches in communist China has been embedded in the nation's political, cultural, and socioeconomic changes including economic liberalization, urban renewal campaigns, and more recently, political anti-associationism. Point two, with economic liberalization, churches have gained more space, social space, and the persecution narrative alone can, can be an overgeneralization. Now, religious freedom in the Chinese context takes on threefold meanings. Level one, whether, whether or not individuals can choose their religious beliefs. Level two, whether or not they can assemble and practice their relief, uh, beliefs. For these two levels, there is freedom. Only people working in the public sector, like government officials and professors teaching in public universities may be pressured to uh, forsake their faith. Level three, whether or not they can form large networks of assembly, um, this is becoming difficult. For now, the, the new wave of government intervention is largely about dismissing large networks of assembly. 
I think this is sometimes I get asked by uh, media people, how, why, what do I think about uh, Western representation of Christianity in China in uh, the media? I think Western Christian media seeks out a persecution narrative eagerly um, with a tone of triumphal, triumphalism. But I think as Christians, we need a more complicated and thoughtful and truthful understanding of how culture affects the um, expression of faith among Christians in China. Point three of my summary, Christians are a censored presence in China. The numerical growth in observation and the censored representation creates a paradoxical reality. But meanwhile, the internet and cyberspace has increasingly become a major arena for the voices of Christians to be heard. So there is a growing, what I call, um, mediated publicness of Chinese Christianity, which will be uh, my next, next, next book. <laughs> the challenges posed by a technological age for, this, for the church is quite similar too. East and West, uh, similar here and, and China. The internet and its commercial culture seems to offer so many opportunities for Christians to, quote, influence the culture for Christ. But Chinese Christians' understanding of this cultural mandate can be subtly changed into a civilization pursuit at the expense of authenticity. More slides. I should have placed this. Um, lastly, coming back to the theme of culture, sociologist George Simo once said, culture referred to, quote, the cultivation of individuals through the agency of external forms which have been objectified in the course of history, end quote. It is a composite milieu of circumstantial parameters, including symbols, languages, values, beliefs, norms, behavioral patterns, artifacts, and social institutions that together <laughs> shape a people's way of life. Christianity in China is a subculture with its distinct history, languages, symbols, and situational understandings that intersects with the broader Chinese culture and communist ideology. For this subculture, with a religious base to be healthy, it needs to preserve its distinctiveness while being able to dialogue with others in a pluralistic society. Because of the past decades of su suppression, some urban churches now have a desire to break through socio-political marginality. But when they seek to do things through technological means, such as the internet and social media, the virtual world presents more challenges to the authenticity of their faith. So as a conclusion, I think, um, to address the question I posed in the beginning uh, for this lecture, churches in China have survived the harshest eras of communism through pressing on with the faith. But it, re it remains a challenge for Chinese churches to survive its nationalistic pride, social apathy in an urbanizing society, and the cultural pluralism in an era of social media. Thank you. Dr. Ma is going to answer some of your questions now. If you have a question, I'd like you to stand and move to where Charles was, in front of that mic in the center. And if you would introduce yourself, your name, and perhaps what, why are you here? <laughs> in other words, what's, what is your interest in this topic? Just a short introduction, and Dr. Ma will answer your question with God's help. So please come to the mic and answer, uh, ask questions. We have 10 minutes. Scott Moreau has a question. I'm Scott Moreau, I've already been introduced. When I look at your third point, I say it remains a challenge for American churches 
to survive a nationalistic pride, social apathy in an urbanizing society, and the cultural pluralism in an era of social media, what lessons perhaps can the Chinese picture help the American churches think things through? And you can go the other way with that if you would like. What lessons do you see in the American church that might help the Chinese church? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> That's a difficult question. I didn't expect. <laughs> uh, um, I think churches in China, um, mainly it's a first generation phenomenon. So the freshness of the gospel is you can see it from many people's testimonies. Um, that freshness is a, an advantage or benefit um, that could inspire people here. Um, although there are cultural complexities they have to work through, I definitely think uh, for most people, the faith, coming to the faith is very, there's a sincerity to it um, because uh, it's very new and countercultural to uh, what they've been uh, lived through. Or for me personally, that was my experience too. Um, but then I mentioned a few times that leadership is lacking in, in China. Uh, as I try to explain to you the truncatedness of most people's faith journeys, um, I think this is where, where the American churches or foreign, uh, in a way, they kind of contributed to the problem. <laughs> well, the previous generation of missionaries. So, so I think we have to think, think through this issue together. Um, we, of course, um, all the passion, zeal uh, to, to short mission is appreciated. But then the unintended consequence of brokenness uh, of this, like a uh, inconsistent mentorship, creates a problem. And um, because I think of mentors mentorship as walking alongside of someone for a certain long period of time, and that'll produce transformative changes. Um, I think churches in China didn't have that in the beginning. Um, that shaped one generation of leaders, and they have their almost like inborn defects, or well, they can they cannot con conquer by themselves. So leadership training, the right kind of leadership training is needed, um, so that um, newer generation or newer converts can be accompanied by accountable leadership when they can uh, come to the faith. Um, I'm a student at Wheaton College, and um, <laughs> my question is, uh, so you talked a lot about culture and how this influenced the general churches, and uh, my question, and you also talked about the missionaries, like the negative consequences that they have. So my question is, like, what, can, what role do you see the missionaries play in China now that you think is more beneficial, like, uh, what can we do Thank you. Thank you for the question. So the question uh, is, uh, what kind of missionary leadership do I expect to see in China right now? Um, I expect to see uh, <clears throat> accountable leadership, um, not just uh, uh, you know uh, parachute missionaries mm. swimming alone, <laughs> finding a few converts, and then um, there has to be accountable structures of accountability and um, respect for the other culture because um, Ch the Chinese culture has its very distinctive uh, distinctness, not just because it's Chinese, but because it's, it has all these common colors to it um, because we're immersed in this, you know, in terms of language and the sense of power. Um, um, the church, uh, missionaries has to spend a certain amount of time to understand the culture before imposing their ways on local groups. Um, I think it takes real humility and accountability to do that. Uh, and I, I won't call the, the, those consequences the negative consequences. I think those are unintended consequences. But um, as, a, as a church together, because 
right now you can do you can do mission to the Chinese everywhere, not just in mainland China. Like right on campuses here, every campus has a certain sizable Chinese population. So to understand the culture and to um, appreciate, but also critically uh, challenge some of the cultural elements, assumptions, is um, very important. My name is Dick Norton. I live near the college here. Um, I have a friend who does a great deal of work in China with the churches and training and so forth. Uh, he's very um, pro-state church uh, organization uh, because he feels there's more freedom there uh, to learn and to advance and so forth. And I just want your perspective on that. If, if I were a Christian in China, a new Christian in China, where would you suggest that I find my fellowship? In a state church or in a house church? Thank you. That's the second question for this evening. Uh, difficult question. Um, I, uh, I tend not to uh, say generalized uh, statements, but I have a chapter devoted to uh, describe, describing how blurry the line has become. It really varies from, from region to region. Take uh, Wenzhou, for example. Actually, many uh, churches that the crosses were taken down, um, they are state churches, but they started by home gathering groups. Because in that city, uh, Christian entrepreneurs had the resources to um, start these groups. So the, the, line, the line is very blurry there. But in Beijing and Shanghai, so these two groups are quite antagonistic towards each other. So um, I've, I've, I've uh, interviewed past, a pastor who serves in a state church, but he tends to direct new com converts to home gathering groups near whoever, like the, the, the neighborhoods. Yeah, he's like the gathering hub of information where to go. So um, they do a cross uh, exchange uh, resources and, um, but it really depends on the region. Um, if I, if I, I knew of a region, like what's, you have to know the state of affairs in the house churches, and then it, it, uh, it's too hard to generalize, but the, um, I think you need lo local knowledge with, um, by discernment, find some mature leaders and then ask their opinions. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know if I answer that. My name is Sia, I'm a student in Wheaton College, um, and I have two questions, um, kind of similar, but the first one is, what would you suggest or conclude as the attitude of the Chinese government or um, communism towards Christian scholars or scholars who study um, Chinese Christian entity? And second, what are some of the challenges that you face as a sociologist who um, conduct research on Christian entity in China? Thank you. Um, so the government towards uh, scholars who does research about Chinese Christianity, um, there used to be a golden window of opportunities. I would think also around the time when urban churches were growing uh, in the early 2000s. Yeah, and then I think by the time 2012, that window of opportunity has shrunk, unfortunately. And my personal experience is that uh, when I got the grant to study this, my university um, just um, frowned on me, uh, looking at me like, what are you doing studying about house churches? But they didn't forbid, they didn't forbid me from doing it. Um, but I learned that two years later, um, no, it was, it was not possible. Even when you get a, a funding from other, um, not other sources. So, um, and I heard from uh, another leading sociologist uh, in the Chi China Academy of Social Sciences that uh, she told me in tears um, that she was, she's much senior, and she was supervising all these dissertation committees of re religious studies, doctoral students in China. Um, so there are many of them now, they want to do religious studies, um, you know, just the topic and the field is kind of expanding, but then uh, in the year that she was supervising, um, 
many of them, the, the tone they wrote their dissertations was mainly to control and constrain and minimize religion. So she felt it's a, it was a reverse trend. Um, those are the observations I had. Um, I, uh, I think especially with religious studies field. Yeah. Hi, good evening, Dr. Ma. My name is Danny. I'm from Shanghai, China, and thank you so much for coming here tonight. Um, regarding the topic of church and state, what is or should be the Christian worldview on the political discourse on the Chinese future? And uh, is there a political system that you foresee can allow the church and CCP survive in the symbiosis? Thank you. Thank you. This is the most difficult question I have tonight. <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> totally beyond my reach. Um, a political system that could accommodate both of them. Well, um, I, I, I do believe as a Christian that um, uh, there's, no, there's no political system that Christians cannot live uh, in. Because um, just because all systems that have happened are ordained by God. <laughs> um, God's providence uh, through even secular um, leaders uh, that I believe, and unfortunately, there are some social systems uh, like uh, communist or socialist systems um, that are more hostile, um, but uh, they have coexisted for a long time. The fact is, um, and I, there, uh, but this question makes me think about the um, the thread that I only mentioned: the civilization pursued among. Uh, Chinese Christians, there, there is a, a tendency of some Christian leaders who have this constanting uh, complex. Um, they hope uh, that political leaders could come to Christ and then they could uh, reverse the system. Uh, well, um, I'm not very convinced by that <laughs> because <laughs> you know what happened in history, right? So um, uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but. Uh, I don't, I don't tend to put things in absolute terms um, because, um, the, yeah, this has to do with much theological discussion I think uh, I cannot do here this evening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Thomas. I'm a Wheaton student as well. Um, I'm wondering that the political, I have two questions. So the political situation has changed a lot um, in these past two or three years in China, and it seems like there's a new trend of persecution. What kind of communism do you think it is or will be in the future 10 years? And also, um, in terms of uh, special administrative regions like Hong Kong, um, where we're seeing more influence from China, how do you feel um, that will affect the situation there? Thank you. Thank you. Um, with the first question, if uh, I were to categorize the face, I would still put it under Wei Wen communism. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of another term to describe it, uh, except using the Chinese term. Um, so um, it, we see almost like a comeback of communist ideology, but it's very different from the 50s. Think about China's economic integration into the whole world economy. Um, communist ideology itself um, not many people put trust in it. So, um, so the, the, the use of it or the effect is really to harmonize or kind of you know, crack on dissent. So um, <clears throat> I think, what was the first question? <laughs> it was nice out. Uh, yeah, anyway, so, in the, oh, and well, as a sociologist, I, I don't project. I don't make projections. I'm not economist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tend to. I want to explain what thing, things that have happened. So we have the facts to gather, and I don't make prophecies. Uh, so and then the world is changing. Um, even here, can you can you project the future for America? We we can't. So thank you. I wanted to ask, my name is Paul Condrell, I'm also a neighbor, I also wanted to ask that red line that you drew, if you could draw that into the future, although you're not having to project political trends, but are you bullish on the church in China for the next 20 or 30 years? Um, I'm pretty confident the church will keep growing. 
because just because I believe their the private economy before it's total <laughs> uh, collapse or um, I think the economy itself provided opportunities structures of opportunities for people to gather assemble and pass on information share so um, I'm not very pessimistic about things returning reversing back to the 50s and as I showed, even, even if that happens, the gospel can still be spread in prison cells. Thank you. Let's, let's thank Dr.